explained to me that he had spent a lot of time in South America, in Germany, in, in uh, France. During the interview, Montez made several strange and incriminating remarks. He said, is it illegal to accidentally, if you're drunk, break into someone's room? Uh, is masturbating a crime in the United States? Things that are odd, things that are, to me, laying down alibis. Montez was also DNA tested, and a police report was filed. It was this report that Tommy Ontko was to read later, with such great interest. When I read the police report, that's when I kind of got the chills, because it said that this individual was at a youth hostel, the same kind of a place that was in France, that he committed a sex crime. So it was very much like the, the M.O of the criminal being sought in France. I wanted to get on the first flight to Miami and just go down to the jail myself that night to make sure that he was in jail, like they said he probably was, because I did not want him getting away. I did not want him getting released. M-O-N-F-T-S. Tommy Ondko, acting on a hunch, had made an incredible discovery. But it was vital he could verify the man being held in Miami was indeed the prime suspect for the murder of Caroline Dickinson. He needed more information. And it was a race against time, as Montez could be bailed at any moment. So Tommy then attempted to contact the French police. But the language barrier and time difference made this extremely difficult. On the verge of giving up, he spoke with a French police officer. She did not speak. English and I don't speak French but she did understand when I kept saying Caroline Dickinson and she gave a series of numbers half in French and half in English that I copied down and I thanked her as much as I could as well as I could and called those numbers. The phone rang about half past eight at night. The number Tommy was given was in fact that of retired British consul Ron Frankel who occasionally acted as translator for the local gendarmes. And I immediately apologized because it was like after six o'clock. I said, well, if I can help you, I will. What's it about? I can't tell you it's top secret. I said, I can't help you if I don't know what you're seeking. Well, he said, I, I really can't tell you. I said, I'll tell you what, uh, Mr. Ontko, give me a clue. Give me a name, give me a place, a name, the subject matter. And Tommy said to me, with a, a, a very strong American accent, Flynn Fugerson. Oh, I said, Flat Fougère. Right, he said, your word? I said, well, it's the Caroline Dickinson case. Yes. We're in business. I told him what I did, who I worked for, and I read the article in the paper and explained that we didn't want to falsely accuse someone who might be an innocent person. So that's why we had to be correct in making sure we had the exact name and date of birth for the individual who was being sought. Ron agreed to help, knowing the importance of keeping Montez in custody in Miami. I said, is he still in prison? He said, I think so, I think so. I said, well, in between me seeking the gendarme, now I know what you want, it's vital. You check that the guy's in prison, and please tell me, do all you can to keep him in prison until the French can get their act together. Although it was the middle of the night, Ron set about trying to track down the officers still leading the investigation. After a succession of calls, he managed to finally make contact. In a strange twist of fate, the officers in charge were en route to England to appear at the inquest into Caroline Dickinson's murder and were about to board a ferry. I phoned, John Luke answered. I said, uh, have you got Caroline file with you? He said, yes, very important. You, you, something interesting? I said, more than interesting. I said, the guy you're looking for is reported in the British press He's been located. I told them an immigration officer in the United States has found him. What he wants to know is his date of birth. And they said, we'll find it for you, we'll find it for you. When Ron saw the results, compared to what I gave him, he didn't want to be the one to say, OK, this is definitely the person. So he said, Tommy, I want you to call the car direct just to make sure that there's no error and get the right information that you need from them called them up. They pulled over to the side of the road again. 
looked through the file to make sure there was no error. They gave me that. They told me um, the name, date of birth, where he was from in Spain. I was still very cautious at the time. I didn't really believe that it was that easy, if you will, and I really didn't uh, want to say that we had our guy. The name of the man being held in Miami and his date of birth, 14th of March, 1950, matched those of Francisco Arce Montes, who had disappeared from France some five years earlier and who was the prime suspect for the murder of Caroline Dickinson. Just before they got on the ferry in France, they, they really didn't have much. They were going to the coroner's inquest in the UK and pretty much, they were, I guess they were going to report that they had no new evidence. And by the time they got off of the ferry in Portsmouth, they had substantial new evidence that they might indeed have a suspect and they might have tracked him down. When my colleague called me, told me that, he told me he had been just uh, arrested uh, in uh, the States. But I had been so many times disappointed. I didn't believe <laughs> at the time as well. I didn't want to believe that. Uh, it was only then when uh, I told him, uh, see the DNA. It's clear, it's his or not his DNA. But what was needed was scientific proof. Francisco Arce Montes was arrested for a sexual assault in Miami, Florida in March 2001. US Customs Officer Tommy Ontko identified him as possibly being the prime suspect for the murder of British teenager Caroline Dickinson in France five years previously. But his detention in the U.S. was dependent on forensic evidence, proving he was indeed Caroline's murderer. Well, after the detainer was put on him, then the DNA testing commenced. The DNA testing was done at the Crime Lab Bureau in Miami by Sharon Hines. She'd already identified Montez as the attacker at the Banana Bungalow by matching his DNA to the sample found on bed sheets at the scene of the crime. But to prove he was Caroline Dickinson's killer, she needed more information. From talking to Tommy, I told him that I would need a DNA profile from a sample uh, from the crime scene. So uh, within a couple days, I received a fax that had a DNA profile on it from some evidence that was collected from the crime scene in France. So the DNA testing was done from our standpoint down there within, I think, two days. We run uh, quite a few sites of DNA because we want to be sure uh, that there couldn't be a random match between a couple sites of DNA. So in this case, uh, I ran some additional sites of DNA, and at that point, um, once we were each done with our testing, we had enough information to say that we thought that the samples were a match. But at that point, um, of course, the laboratory in France wanted their own samples so that they could confirm it. For a tense three days, everyone again held their breath. And a press conference had been called um, here in Rennes on the steps of the Palais de Justice to announce the results of the, of the DNA test. This was going to be the big moment, really. A lot of, a lot of people were hoping and praying that, this was gonna, that, that, that uh, he was the guilty man, that, you know, that this, this, this terrible affair was finally going to be resolved and that uh, Caroline's killer was going to, was, was going to be found. The DNA of Francisco Arce Montes matched the sample found at the scene of Caroline Dickinson's murder. For Father John Dickinson, it was the news he'd been waiting for for more than five years. I wouldn't like to, to say anything that's going to prejudice the uh, continuing investigation and uh, uh, the legal processes, but uh, uh, you know, we're very happy with the way things are at the present time. The breakthrough obviously came when the DNA was matched in the US and in France. That was the match, that was the point. To that point, there was no 100% certainty that it was our suspect. From the beginning of this case, the only thing we were sure it was the test, the DNA test. The problem was to find him. I think those who really thought about it realized that um, here was a, a triumph, really, for John Dickinson, because John Dickinson had kept plugging away uh, asking for information. He kept doing interviews, he kept uh, speaking to the press. To all intents and purposes, John Dickinson's campaign for information, John Dickinson's campaign for justice, had, uh, had worked. It was a great success. But John Dickinson would have to wait for justice. It took six months for Montez to be extradited from the United States to France, 
and a further two years for the trial. At the proceedings, Montez admitted rape, but pleaded not guilty to murder, claiming Caroline's death had been an accident, and that he was mentally ill, so was not responsible for his actions. For him, we, we said, he has full responsibility, because he has the full conscience of what he is able to do. Even if he had drank uh, some wine, some uh, alcohol, even if he was a drug addicted, he is responsible. On the 14th of June 2004, after a three week trial, Montez was unanimously found guilty of murder and sentenced to life imprisonment. The events of the last week have 